Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours in the Backyard. Uh, this is the webcast where I answer your top voted questions from PollGab out about uh, Microsoft database products. If you'd like to ask your own questions, hit the first link in the description, and you can post your descriptions there. So, oh man, it's so nice outside in terms of weather. I just couldn't wait to go do uh, Office Hours outside today. It was just so charming. So the top voted question is from Nick, who says, I'm a new starter at an organization that has lots of rules, and one of them is that IntelliSense is forbidden. I asked why, and I was told that this was a decision that was from a long time ago, and it was due to some apparent negative impact on servers. Is there any truth to this? Yes. Uh, for a long time, Intel, and it may even still happen, uh, IntelliSense would blow chunks if your database had, say, tens of thousands of objects in it, or if your database server was extremely slow and lots of people were using Management Studio at the same time. Um, so yeah, there has been truth to that. What I would ask is, is it okay if we revisit that Unless your, your organization has tens of thousands of objects in a database, in which case they're probably not going to revisit it. Next up, Adrian says, Hi Brent, have you ever recommended change data capture or change tracking to your customers? Um, no, only because I don't do any ETL work. I don't populate data warehouses or anything like that. Um, I leave that to the folks who do that kind of work. The one thing that I would say is when you turn those features on, there's an overhead, just like there is to any feature inside of SQL Server. When you turn it on, you're causing the SQL Server to do more work. I've had clients where they turned on the, uh, one of those features and it brought the SQL Server to its knees because the SQL Server was already just way too busy with the work that it already had. So just be mindful of that. Uh, next up, Frost says, what can you say about SQL Server 2025? Um, really nothing, because the, pr the uh, public releases aren't even out yet. The public previews aren't out yet. In the last couple of versions, Microsoft has had this tough problem where they've claimed a feature uh, would be part of a release, and then it either didn't ship at all, or else it wasn't ready at release time, and sometimes took years in order to release. So I don't really put into any faith or concern into things that they say will be ready until at the very least we have preview versions so we can see if it works or not. If I was you, I wouldn't put any thought into that either. We still don't even have a release date for the first uh, public preview. So I wouldn't concern yourself too much with that. My guess is that the final release of SQL Server 2025 will be likely in November or December of this year, uh, just as we saw with earlier versions, the kind of skating in under the, 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 uh, uh, the deadline there, which is kind of a shame because really in a perfect world, they would label a release like that with SQL Server 2026, you know, and make it seem more timely, but they got to slap 2025 on there because they're already running so late. Uh, next up, someone with an emoji snowman name says, I only recently learned that you can take copy-only backups on availability group secondaries. What's the use case for this? Uh, the use case is if you want to offload your full backups, uh, but typically you still do your transaction log backups on the primary. Uh, but for some uh, organizations, their full backups are so invasive in terms of performance that they need to offload them. Uh, next up, Depender says, is it worth it to be a dual stack database administrator like SQL Server plus another platform? How do you keep them separate in your brain? The more platforms you try to know, the less current you can be with each of them. So there may be a value uh, to knowing multiple database platforms if your company needs it. 
or if you're in the midst of making a skill transition, or if you want to help other companies make a skill transition. Uh, but just generally be aware that that means you're going to know each of them less well. That's certainly the case with me for Microsoft SQL Server. I gave up on knowing uh, availability groups or clustering, the latest changes in those, uh, just because, too, I didn't think it was that useful going forward from a cloud career perspective, uh, that I'd rather take some of that space in my brain and use it for other database platforms instead. Uh, next, SQL Padawan says, I came here after your post about your sexuality. I'm pansexual, and every couple few years I write about that just to remind folks. He says, it takes guts to bring that subject publicly and receive the virtual stones. Um, you, and if, the last part of it is, have you lost clients, followers, or friends after sharing that in public? Yeah, but the thing that I would say is, is if you lose someone as a friend or follower, because you share what you are, then are they really your friend? Are they really worth keeping around as a friend? Probably not. That's my approach, at least. Like if a friend of mine came out and said, you know, oh, here's my sexuality, I'd be like, okay, that's cool. I support you. I want you to be a happy, fulfilled individual, and I don't really care what your sexuality is. So. Uh, next up, Nick asks, when corruption happens on non-clustered indexes, is it safe to drop those and recreate them to remove the corruption instead of restoring the, the database from backup? Yeah, absolutely, but just be aware that whatever caused that corruption, if you don't fix that, then the corruption's probably going to come back and it's going to strike something that you can't restore later. Generally, when I'm, I've got a server that's facing corruption issues, two things are going to happen. One, I'm going to make sure it's updated to the latest build of SQL Server. Not the latest version, just the latest patch level for that SQL Server. Because there have been a lot of corruption bugs that have hit SQL Server. And two, I want to get off that hardware. Like I want to fail over to another node in the cluster or a different replica in the availability group and pave the old box and reinstall it from scratch. Wipe Windows, wipe Linux if you're doing that, reinstall the OS from scratch, reinstall SQL Server, because odds are you probably have a driver problem or a firmware problem that's causing that corruption. And of course, if you don't fix it, then you're going to have that problem again. Sysadmin asks, is there a way to remove cached statistics on temp tables? Yeah, there's, there are lots of them, actually, and I cover it in my Fundamentals of TempDB class. Check out that Fundamentals of TempDB class. Uh, next up, Trapped in the Cloud asks, do you still distribute your doc SQL Server performance tuning in Google Compute Engine? I can't find it. No, I haven't had a client. I've had one client, I think, in the last six or seven years that's been on Google Compute Engine. And it's not that it's not good. There's, it's not to say there's something wrong with it per se. It's just to say that I haven't had hands-on experience with it in the last seven or eight years. And it doesn't make sense to distribute a guide on something that's rapidly evolving. Uh, then, you know, what's the point of, of trying to tell you that I know how to do something and I should tell you how to do it uh, if I'm not doing it myself? I don't fake my way through that. Uh, next up, Uncle asks, in terms of SQL Server backups, is it better to rely on enterprise backup software or conventional native backup software? It all depends on how much time you have and what the permissions are like in your enterprise. I find that generally speaking, the larger a company is, the more they want to separate out roles. They want to have Windows admins who manage Windows. They want to have backup admins who manage backups. They want to have SQL Server admins who just man manage SQL Server. Um, whereas the smaller a company is, the more it tends to be one person does everything. Is one of those uh, approaches best? Not at all. They're just different. They're just different is all. Somebody could do a crappy job at an enterprise and somebody can do a crappy job at a small server shop. Often I, I've seen database administrators who are like, I don't trust anyone else to do my backups. And then we run SP Blitz on their server and they have all kinds of problems and they haven't been fixing the problems they're supposed to be fixing. 
Uh, my tea got cold says I've never seen anyone talk about contained availability groups since they were announced. Were they any good? Um, it's been so long since they came out. I can't remember. I remember looking at them briefly for a client um, and that it never, it didn't solve a problem that the client needed to solve. And I remember looking at the restrictions and being like, oh. And since then, I've, I don't think I've ever had a client come to me and say, here's the problem I need to solve. And me look at that and say, oh, contained availability groups is the way to accomplish that. I, I don't think that that means it's a bad feature, though. I think it just means that it's solving a problem, hopefully, uh, that I don't have, that maybe other people have. But I don't think I've ever even seen a client using it. So I'd be curious to what problem you're trying to solve that makes you think contained availability groups is the answer, and then I would go from there. Rojo asks, can you discuss your current guidelines for antivirus on the SQL Server? I know some people out there will say, I don't believe that uh, SQL Server should have antivirus. I disagree. I feel that SQL Server should have antivirus. Because I've seen what y'all do on your SQL servers. Let me remote desktop in. Let me run Chrome. I'm going to install FileZilla. I'm going to run Management Studio on the server. I need to debug things with Visual Studio. I'm going to test my own apps on... No, what? Duh. Good. So, yeah, I'm totally a fan of antivirus on the SQL server. Now, my SQL servers, no, because I don't use them for that stuff. I don't remote desktop into my SQL servers, but you, you got your dirty fingers all over the RDP session. It's gross. Mr. ZBD says, is there any reason to keep data forever? Well, what you should do is you should ask your business. So some businesses do want to keep data forever. And I'll give you an example of one that I worked with. One that I worked with was a gaming company that uh, dealt with poker and they wanted to track every poker hand that was ever played on their website. They wanted to track uh, every move that someone made, every decision that they made when they saw cards in front of them. They wanted to be able to recognize patterns so that if someone created a new account and then behaved similarly, that they would be able to spot it right away. Um, so there is, in some cases, value for stuff like that to stick around forever. What you want to ask is, what does your business want to do with it? Uh, let's see, next up, Bandu says, what are your pros and cons for implementing multi-tenancy at the server level or at the database level? Oh, check out, I've got a blog post on this. Go to uh, search, like whatever search engine you prefer to use, and search for Brent Ozar, how to design multi-tenant databases, and I give you the pros and cons over there. Like, and I go into detail. I, it's not that I can give you a 60-second version of the answer. It makes much more sense to hit the post. Next up, 30 years till retirement asks, I'm about 10 years into my data career. I've heard some people say on a podcast that it takes three to six months to find a new job. I would have assumed it was six weeks at most. Is this a case of me having low standards for future employers? Um, the, the, the economy's different right now. Um, there are so many layoffs happening. There are so many companies that are looking for very specific skills. Uh, there are so many companies that are not hiring because they think they're going to get by with less. There are so many people who are staying in their jobs because they're afraid. Um, there are so many fake positions being advertised. Uh, companies will advertise fake uh, positions, harvest all kinds of resumes, and then do things with those resumes later. Recruiters use them as spam honeypots. Right now, applying for work is a really terrible deal, and I don't think that three to six months is unusual if you're talking to strangers. That's why if you're even passively looking for work, you should talk to everybody in your network that you've worked with in the past. Say, hey, I'm just getting a feel for what's out there. Do y'all have any need for anyone who does the kinds of things that I do? 
And then that way you'll be able to short circuit to the top of the list and they may never even uh, post a position. They may just make a position just for you because your former coworkers know the strength of your skills. But if you're competing with strangers, yeah, buckle up. It's gonna suck a lot worse than you expected. Ricardo asks, we use Chromebooks instead of Windows laptops. What's the best way to administer cloud-based servers, uh, either PowerShell or uh, remote desktop? The remote desktop into something called a jump box and do your work from there. Uh, next up, tr what's the problem you're trying to solve asks. My friend recently ran SP Blitz Index on a table with a million and a half rows and 450 indexes. Uh, lots of ongoing things about statistics and stats. Should he be worried? Go check out the URL column of SB Blitz Index. The URL column has information with more info about the warnings for each of those. I get really frustrated. I put so much work of my life into building free tools and free documentation for people to solve their problems. And I try to tie it all together and people won't read. And on one hand, I get really angry about that because it's their career. Your career depends on you reading things. Your career doesn't depend on you asking other people for help. Anyone can ask other people for help. But when there's documentation right there and you don't read it, It's going to be a hot, tough row for you there. Uh, let's see. We'll do one more. Um, oh, interesting. Mike says, how do you treat people who do not use the SP prefix when creating their stored procedures? Uh, is that okay for you, or do you think everything should have a prefix? Oh, Mike, it's really interesting. There are actually people who say you should not create stored procedures with SP underscore. Because technically, when you run an SP underscore stored procedure, SQL Server checks the master database and then checks your current context. So it's ever so slightly slower for execution when they start with SP. When I create stored procedures for user databases, I tend to create them with USP underscore. So that way it's more obvious that it's a user stored procedure instead of a system stored procedure. Now, do I care what people name them? Not at all. I couldn't care less. I've seen people use uh, stored proc names as like get customer or insert customer. That's totally fine. You got to pick your battles, choose what the biggest problem is that you want to go tackle. And I find that I, I tend to let people make decisions that don't matter go ahead make do whatever you choose to do on things that don't matter but on the things that do matter things like making sure you don't have uh, sql injection risks in your dynamic sql stored procedure i'm going to be a lot more of a stickler about that all right well it's another nice day out here in vegas today we are going down to chinatown to go get uh, soup dumplings oh my god there's one of my favorite restaurants in the world is a cheap soup dumplings place on uh, Spring Mountain Road. And then we're going to Area 15 and Meow Wolf. It's this really cool art installation. It's kind of like Disneyland for adults. And I say that in a weird way. It's not like Disneyland isn't for adults. It is, but it's like Disneyland for adults in that it really aims at uh, more interesting uh, uh, art type stuff. And then they've also got an arcade and all kinds of virtual reality stuff as well. So hope you have fun, and I will see you on the next Office Hours. Adios.